So following up on the description of the PEPFAR-AstraZeneca um, partnership um, and dis and coming to the point of view of how are we going to deal with the epidemic and what is a sustainable HIV response. And actually, I'm, I've sort of unabashedly taken this from Debbie Burke's slides without giving her credit. But she's defined it as that sustainability and a sustainable HIV response is not only about funding. It really can be considered that a sustainable response can only be achieved when the epidemic is under control and no longer expanding. So it's really not so much how much money, but how well you invest the money to get where you want to go. So how do we achieve epidemic control? And the mantra at PEPFAR is the right things, the right places, right now, and then the right way. And I think that those types of um, approaches and that type of thinking is something that we can really benefit from by at, the, at our domestic level in terms of how we look to getting the results and to translating the results into clinical practice so that we really ultimately have an impact on the epidemic. Another way to think about it is, is what, are being, what kind of results are being found in some of the studies in PEPFAR and in the African countries where PEPFAR is really active. And one of the results from the studies um, in South Africa and some of the other countries is a direct impact on the um, incidence of HIV infection in young girls that staying in school has on um, um, on their health. And the estimates are by staying one more year, they can reduce the incidence by a significant amount. And this is something that resonates. This is the, young, uh, the DREAMS initiative in uh, many of the African countries. But it's something, when you look at the domestic um, HIV infection, also resonates. And so, for example, these are um, um, demographic uh, slides or demographic pictures of the HIV endemic, uh, epidemic and infections in, uh, in Los Angeles. And on the left, it's by um, zip code, or it's on the right, I'm sorry, on the right, it's by what the zip codes look like. And on the left, it's where the new diagnoses are. And the darker the color is where the more HIV infection is occurring. And what you can see is that there's really a concordance between the dark green on the left and the darker red colors on the right. If you look at it from the point of view of prevalence and high school education, there's an inverse correlation. On the left, it shows you persons living with HIV or AIDS diagnosis, and this was a, a sort of similar data that I just showed you, where the intensity of the colors are localized towards the middle of the map. If you look at um, the percent of the population in those districts that have a high school education, there's an inverse correlation. Um, uh, as to the HIV prevalence um, and, and where the infections are occurring relative to education. So I think there's a lot of linkages between what is happening with the studies in Africa and how we can think about the data and s that some of the problems and the challenges are really not that different independent of the global um, localization of, of where the studies are being done. The way that the U.S. government follows the, or takes part or monitors the sustainable develop, go, development goals and looks at 90-90-90 targets um, is actually put out in the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And there's a federal interagency working group, and I just found out about this recently, and I was at the, the, the meeting um, September 8th at... Um, not at the White House, unfortunately, but right next door in the Eisenhower building. So it was probably the closest I've ever been to the White House because you get right inside the sort of perimeter, which is really hard to do right now. But the interesting um, uh, reason for having the meeting and what was reported by the CDC representatives was this updated um, supplement for the indicators. And so the way the U.S. tracks the epidemic in the United States and reports it is by looking at a series of indicators that have been developed. And while there's probably too much detail to see this clearly, they actually have different goals and the check marks, the green check marks mean we've achieved and the red X's means we've not. And I think you can see that under goal three, reducing HIV related disparities, there's more uh, red um, X's than there are in some of the others. 
when they actually showed some of the data, and I'm going to go through this just really quickly to show you the trends, it was really um, sort of striking. So, and this is reducing new infections, and on the left, the bars show what the, um, the percents were across different years, and, and on the right side under 2020 is the target. So the target is to have 90% of people in the United States know their zero status by 2020, and even by 2013, we're at 87%. So we're doing pretty well in terms of um, the first 90. If we're looking, though, to reduce the incidence, and this is a sort of surrogate marker the way the CDC reports it, they talk about new diagnoses, but it's in the same group with the same amount of testing. So the, the um, reduction that you want to see by 2020 is not just because you do fewer testing, but you actually do the same number of tests and find that you have a lower incidence. And what you can see there is we have some work to do. We're only at 40, 41,000. Um, and we need to get down to 33,000. Some of these other numbers, the improved link or the linkage to care within 30 days on the left-hand panel, um, we're making progress, but we're not really, I don't think, aggressi aggressively achieving goals over the next six years that uh, really uh, let, lead us to believe that we're going to get to 85%. Um, increased retention in care is really a serious problem, and, and I think from two perspectives. One is we're only about halfway where we need to be, but really over the last four to five years, there's been no change. So whatever we're doing, we're not doing well enough to have an impact. And um, similarly, the increased viral suppression to 90%, the last 90, we're way off target there. And again, the trajectory does not look good for being able to achieve um, where we want to be by 2020. I think some of the health outcomes are also really serious um, in terms of the trajectories and where they are. If we want to get down to decreasing homelessness to 5% by 2020, again, we're nowhere near that, and we've had very little impact on that particular indicator. Um, reducing deaths has been successful. We, by 2013, really achieved the goal that was set for 2020, so that part is doing well. I think the health, di the HIV diagnosis disparities, and this is the last panel I'm going to show you in, oh, with some of these data, are really disturbing. Um, the MSM, the effect on MSM and reducing it is also, the trajectory is not changing and we're not approaching the index. These are index kinds of numbers for 2020 um, uh, for the indicators and we're really not making much progress in the MSM. In black females, again, we actually achieved the 2020 goal in 2012 and they're talking about how to um, uh, change that and, and make a, a, a stronger target that we can reach. Um, but the young black MSM also are, um, there's been very little impact on the epidemic there, and the chances of reaching the targets for 2020 are not good. And of course, in the south part of the United States, and I think that has some implications here in North Carolina as sort of leaders of the southern region of the United States. Again, very little impact on the epidemic um, over the last five to six years. And while this, again, is an index number, it's the trajectory and the, um, where we're supposed to be by 2020 is not good. So we have serious challenges still in the United States in terms of controlling and stably, you know, sustaining a, a non-expanding epidemic. And from a global point of view, there's also still a lot to done. And the numbers that we have here are really from one week of data. When there's over 4,000 babies infected, almost 35,000 deaths, um, including 7,000 young women, almost 3,000 deaths from children, and over 20,000 um, uh, deaths in, among HIV and um, infected adults. So we really need to do better in the next 15 years. I think this is achievable. And as the, what the role of the OAR is going to be in doing this is to really try to um, set, help set reasonable targets and accelerate the process so that we can get this epidemic under control. Someone was just saying to me recently, and I think it's sort of an interesting way to look at this, and that is um, 
you know, the new, the election now, the new president will start in 2017, and if the tradition holds, they could be in power for eight years. Just think if we can set it up so that they can be the president who's gonna say we're on a trajectory that by 2030 we've got this under control. And I hadn't thought about it that way, but it's really a pretty amazing way to think about it. That's how much impact we can have. Um, and so I applaud you and your efforts. Um, I'm not deserting the research field because my lab is gonna be moving here and I'm still gonna be collaborating with John, so I will be hanging around Duke at different times. And um, I look forward to having some questions. I think we have some time, um, and I'd be happy to answer questions and hear your comments. Are you asking a question? No, I'm oh. <laughs> taking questions, and I'm the runner to people who want to ask something. So I'll ask the question. So um, strategies around vaccines. There's a lot of people here that are dabble in that field. Um, I have to chair a call at 4 o'clock about the uh, initiative for, the, for a pediatric um, role in, in vaccine development. And this is a group discussion because we have to wake Tony up over there. But, uh, is vaccine achievable? And if so, should we push hard and make it a short-term goal? Or should we, or, or do we put it on the back burner and pay attention to things that are easier to achieve? Since if I remember correctly, in 1992, David Ho stood next to Bill Clinton and they promised a vaccine uh, during the Clinton administration, but they didn't say which Clinton. <laughs> Actually, it was promised in the Reagan administration as soon as they found out that it was a virus. I forget who the Secretary of Health was at the time, but she, that's right. And she said, no problem, two years we'll have a vaccine. I think She must have thought it was Zika or Ebola or something like that. Um, now, there's no way to have long-term sustainable control of HIV if we don't have a vaccine. And you know, I think the people here know better than anyone else what's in the pipeline and, and the excitement about what's in the pipeline. Um, some of the results that were um, described at um, the International AIDS Society meeting in Durban, some of the big publications that just came out. I'm very optimistic. I, I, I'm really sure we can do this. I think what what it has done, I mean, I think the challenges and the reason that it has been so difficult was totally unexpected. And what it really tells us is that there are still huge gaps in our understanding of human immunology. But, you know, again, the whole resurgence of studying immunology and the immune response in humans is something that only happened in the last 30 years. I did my PhD on mice because nobody did human stuff at that time and even for a long time afterwards. I mean, I remember one time John and I were talking to somebody at the University of Florida who told us, you can't do anything elegant if you're not doing transgenic mice. And the fact that the mice may not resemble humans, well, that's the, that's the human problem, not the mouse problem, you know? So I think that, um, you know, we have a, a terrific opportunity. I think we should pull in all the expertise that we need. I think while these trials that are in the pipeline are, are going on, I think we should be brainstorming and thinking, as still continue to think outside the box as to what we need to do. Because the biggest problem, I think, is we can't wait another 10 years following you know, RV144. We really, and this is part of it, we need to have things going on in different areas simultaneously as much as possible. And I know that's a big investment, but the other piece of it, too, is you know, how can we think about adjusting our endpoints to at least have some interim indication that something's working and not wait? Every clinical trial, I don't think, has to be five years with five years of follow-up. Um, we just don't have 10 years to wait. And so I think if we can start to think about biomarkers and surrogate markers for endpoints, that it would at least give us a mid-course assessment if we're on the right track or be willing to say, you know, this isn't meeting the criteria, we need to think, think differently. Any comments about vaccines? 
probably won't get any arguments about that here. <laughs> what about cure? Are you, were you uh, like, <laughs> cure. You know, cure is aspirational and I think it brings out the best in us in terms of thinking outside the box and in terms of having simultaneous approaches. It's also, if you think about it now, really the umbrella for basic research in, in um, viral host interactions, host cell interactions. And I think that component, which is really the, you know, sort of the aspect that I come from is really, really important. I don't, there's still an awful lot about HIV that we don't know, and I think this is what the cure agenda is showing us, because again, if it were gonna be easy, we would have done it by now, because the field is, probably has the, the most amazing, intelligent, smart, creative people in it as, to, as any other area of biomedical research. And so I think if, if it had been easy, we would have figured it out. But what it's telling us again is we really don't know. This virus is an amazing virus. Um, I know over the years I really worried about sounding so enthusiastic about HIV research because I, you know, I sort of felt like people thought I was a little weird because like how could I be so excited about a virus that caused so much problems? But it is an amazing virus and how it has adapted to um, find the vulnerabilities in almost every aspect of human systems is, is just amazing. And I think we really do need to understand more um, for the future control of the virus. Um, about how does it interact, and where is it hanging out, and I don't think we should overlook my favorite cell, the monocyte macrophage. <laughs> so you're giving me a chance to do my pitch about. <laughs> and one last question for me, and that is, uh, Colleen and I suffered uh, in the trenches on the adolescent trials uh, network for almost 15 years, and we had to deal with not only the biology of HIV in youth, but also the behavioral science portion of that. And fortunately, that network was dichotomized into a behavioral leadership group and a therapeutics leadership group, and ne'er the twain ever really met. And so, what is the future for the behavioral scientists and the biologist in terms of, um, of bringing those two groups together in, in, in the agenda? Yeah, you're sort of, you're touching on an area that other people have talked about already. I mean, in 60 days, I've been lobbied by every possible component, I think, of the, of the field. But I really do think that in terms of, you know, an area that really needs to be integrated, and, and, and this comes from both sides, we're not going to get where we want to do. No, it doesn't matter how good the drugs are we develop. It doesn't matter how effective the vaccine is. If we can't get people to use it, we haven't met our goals. And so I think it's really essential that we continue the conversation. I know there's been some starts. People tell me, oh, they're so, you know, the behavioral people, those biologists are so hard to talk to, and the molecular people just go crazy when they have to talk to bi behavioral people. But I think we need to recognize that, and we need to facilitate the conversation. You can't learn a new language in a single sit down, right? And that's what we have to do, because we really need each other um, in terms of getting to where we want to be. And so I, challenge both sides if there are activities um, that you would like OAR to spearhead or sponsor, I would be happy to hear about it because I really, really think it's a crucial area. And I know people have talked about the behavioral sciences not being a separate component of the high priority, but when you look at it, it goes across all of the priorities. Um, and we really, really need innovative thinking and again, we can't, but I will say, we cannot wait and do another you know, 500 observational qualitative interview type studies and have 10 years with you know, not convincing or really definitive data. So I, I challenge you to talk to your colleagues. You should have some kind of think tank. Oh, well, so I, I just wanted to get back to vaccine, but incorporate it with your comment about the behavior. 
Um, at least in my memory of, of um, vaccines that we've um, implemented where we've decided that we're going to give them to people as an adolescent or an adult, um, in spite of lots of people's attempts at modifying behavior and getting people to take those. So if you remember the hepatitis B vaccine that we were supposed to give to at-risk young men, um, and the HPV vaccine, which we've yet to deliver to very high uh, percentages of people. The only time we've effectively administered vaccines to large percentages of the population is when we give the vaccine in infancy. In spite of that, the HIV vaccine effort, it's been like pulling teeth to get people to agree to any vaccines in infancy. And, and is there a way we can sort of remind people that if we really want a universal vaccine, that's when we're going to have to deliver it. We're not, 40 year olds are not really good at signing up for immunizations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, your, your point is well taken. And I mean, you, you probably know more about the politics or the what's driving the policies in terms of that. Um, you know, if, if you see that this is an area that you, that OAR can, can play a role in, in pulling together the right people, putting some focus, you know, really putting some attention on this. Um, I've been told that OAR has amazing um, capacity and for um, convening. And so I'm very, very keen to um, take advantage of my convening power to the extent that it helps. But I really, I think if you, you know, really we should have some more conversations. And this goes for all the other areas as well. And this is why I think it's really important to continue to look at what we do and evaluate it frequently and constantly to say, are we still right on, the, is this still the right way to go? Um, is there any way to expand the program? I still don't quite understand why they can't be doing um, you know, parallel studies, why does it have to be everything sequentially waiting for the results? You know, if we could do five different things and come out five years from now with a much broader picture of what, what the possibilities are, it would really inform us a lot more rapidly in how to move forward for the next five years. But we don't have a lot of time if we're really going to do this right. Okay. Oh, yes, right. Wilton. Wilton. Excuse me for jumping in. <laughs> You should probably ask Dr. Fauci that question. <laughs> Most of the microbiome work, as you know, really falls under NIAID. And, um, but I think, and I, and I don't know all of the information about what's going on because the scope of the NIH portfolio is enormous. I mean, you probably know more about what RFAs and things are on the street. But it certainly um, is, is an important area. As you say, it's an emerging area. I think all the omics are really, crucial to, 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 in general, for biomedical research and for, for health and disease um, strategies going forward. And I really think that there, as much attention, ways of harmonizing data, harmonizing the way that those studies are done are really, really critical so that we can really mine the data and, and um, you know, take advantage of the discoveries that are hidden in there. It's, I know that it's tough, but it's, it's, it's like, the, it's the new frontier. So one thing I'm going to challenge you with, if I can, is everyone keeps talking to me now about the moonshot for cancer. And I've been trying to think, and I'm going to challenge the HIV community. So what should our sort of PR approach be? Are we going to go to Mars, or should we do something entirely different? But think about it, because you know the impact on the public of this kind of um, uh, message is really important. And I think going forward, you know, I, I don't mean to be, I'm, I'm really quite serious about this, and it's not a glitzy attempt, but I think we really have to be very, very cognizant of the mood in Congress and the oversight that Congress plays in, in our agenda and, the, and in the resources that, were deploy, that are deployed for HIV AIDS. And there really is a concern that 
there's a manipulation almost of trying to pitch, pit diseases against each other. And so I would like to think about how to get ahead of that curve. I don't want to be in a situation where I have to fight with Richard Hodas, who's the director of the Institute of Aging, that HIV is more important than Alzheimer's, you know, in a public setting. But it's almost as a result of the last few years, that's sort of where things are moving. More than any other field, I think HIV AIDS requires that you, the, the people who are in the field, really pay attention to the political environment and to really pay attention to how policy is made and how these policies impact your, your life and our lives in general in the research community. Um, and don't um, make sure you vote, make sure you're out there talking to people and think about ways of um, messaging that will resonate um, and get across the amazing work that's, that's been done and all the excitement of what's going on right now. <laughs> Thank you.